You would think that fibrous dysplasia would be an easy diagnosis to make. It has a typical radiologic appearance, it occurs typically in the mid-face, but there are some curveballs in fibrous dysplasia and some mimics that can make it more challenging. There are three radiologic forms of fibrous dysplasia. The one we're all familiar with is the ground glass form that's classically associated with fibrous dysplasia, but it comes in two other forms as well, a cystic form and a pagetoid form. Uh, if you know what ground glass looks like, all three of these terms are pretty self-explanatory. The most common is the ground glass appearance. This is the classic look of an expanded bone with this uniform appearance of intermediate density bone. Classic ground glass. This is the cystic form of fibrous dysplasia. Yes, there's some ground glass here for sure, but this jaw is expanded and there is relatively little calcification in the center of these large cystic areas. Notice that the cortex is relatively intact around the expanded bone and that the overall shape of the mandible is preserved. The pagetoid form looks, as you have probably guessed, like Paget's disease. Here's an example where there's a thickened cortex around the outside and a cystic central. It's important to understand that all three forms, radiologic forms, of fibrous dysplasia can appear in the same lesion. And in fact, this combination of ground glass and cystic and pagetoid appearance is often the best clue that you're dealing with fibrous dysplasia, although it is possible for any one of the three to appear all by itself. One of the important things about fibrous dysplasia is that it maintains the configuration of the underlying bone. This is probably the most di important diagnostic clue. Notice that I can still see the crystagalli sticking up from the anterior skull base here. Notice that this lamina papyricea, while incredibly thick, still has the basic shape of the lamina papyricea. Even as we turn the corner and come onto the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus here, it's still shaped like the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus. So fibrous dysplasia expands a bone but maintains an underlying configuration of that bone. Famously, fibrous dysplasia compromises underlying foramina. Here's a great example of expansile bone in the sphenoid wall and in the anterior clinoid process coming together to compress the optic canal. You can imagine the effect that this would have on vision. And this is one of the most important clinical problems that comes from fibrous dysplasia in the mid face and skull base is comp compromising foramina. Another thing that they can do is they can obstruct outflow, similar to the foramina problem. Here is an area of fibrous dysplasia. It has a pretty characteristic ground glass appearance. And here are the ethmoid air cells and sphenoid sinus that were obstructed by the expansile bone forming this mucosal. Another famous thing about fibrous dysplasia is how it spares the otic capsule. So you often get fibrous dysplasia of the temporal bone, but it stops dead right when it hits the otic capsule. You can see the fibrous dysplasia all the way around, collapsing the air cells of the middle ear and mastoid, and yet the inner ear is pristine, absolutely preserved, even coming out and around this posterior semicircular canal. It is preserved. Fibrous dysplasia can be very hot on PET. You can see that uh, here is a lesion uh, that you can see on the PET, and then here's the corresponding PET CT, still a hot lesion right in the middle of the skull base. It turns out that this is just fibrous dysplasia. Presumably the increased FDG avidity is from blood pool from this very vascular lesion. One of the problems with fibrous dysplasia is that it can de-differentiate into sarcoma, either osteosarcoma or chondrosarcoma. You can see fibrous dysplasia all through the mid-face here, but what's concerning are these erosive areas where the cortex just dead ends into an erosive uh, mass. This is uncharacteristic of fibrous dysplasia itself, and when you see an aggressive mass in the center,
adding of fibrous dysplasia, you need to become concerned about degeneration into sarcoma. Here is what the axial image of that looks like, and this really looks like a, 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 an aggressive mass in this location. Fibrous dysplasia famously occurs in the mid face, but it can really occur anywhere. Here's an example again of, uh, of, of the pagetoid form of fibrous dysplasia occurring within the clivus. Here's an example of fibrous dysplasia occurring within one of the turbinates. So it can appear anywhere, even though the mid face is a common location. Despite having a benign CT appearance, the MR appearance of fibrous dysplasia can be very disturbing and easily mistaken for a tumor. There is a whole separate lecture on this particular case um, trying to fool you into thinking this is something more aggressive. Now let's talk about other diseases that can mimic fibrous dysplasia. Famously, ossifying fibroma mimics fibrous dysplasia both radiologically and histopathologically. For a long time, it was almost impossible for the pathologist to distinguish these two lesions. Now there are stains that can help with that, but the H&E can be identical. Look at this ground glass appearance here and some cystic stuff around the outside. It looks just like fibrous dysplasia. Here's the key difference. This is a rounded mass filling the sphenoid sinus. This does not have the configuration of the underlying bone. We talked about how important it was that fibrous dysplasia maintains the underlying configuration of the bone, whereas ossifying fibroma has a rounded, spherical, mass-like appearance that differentiates it radiologically from fibrous dysplasia. Sometimes ossifying fibroma will have a characteristic radiating pattern of calcification, but you don't always get that lucky. A fibrous osteoma can also look like fibrous dysplasia. Um, this is not the ivory osteoma that we frequently see in the sinuses. This one has a more fibrous look to it, but it looks just like the ground glass that we expect in fibrous dysplasia. Again, the key is that this is mass-like encroaching into the center of the sinus rather than expansion of one of the walls. Is this a thickened inner sinus septum? No. Is this a thickened anterior table? No. Is it a thickened posterior table well it probably arose from the posterior table so it's a little thickened but it's not just that posterior table enlarging unto itself to form fibrous dysplasia renal osteodystrophy famously uh, produces the same ground glass appearance and expansion of bone that we can see in fibrous dysplasia the key for renal osteodystrophy is that it is diffuse it's symmetric it's a metabolic lesion not a focal lesion uh, like fibrous dysplasia now fibrous dysplasia can be very extensive but it is rarely symmetric and diffuse like renal osteodystrophy is you knew this one was coming. If there's a pagetoid form of fibrous dysplasia, of course, Paget's disease is a mimic. Look at the expansion of bone all through the central skull base. This one happens to be Paget's disease, but it looks a lot like the pagetoid form of fibrous dysplasia, of course. There are several different ways that we may encounter osteoneogenesis mimicking fibrous dysplasia. The most common way we run into osteoneogenesis is in the setting of chronic sinusitis, where the walls of the affected sinus begin to grow in and fill inward and collapse the center air cell. You can see here, this patient actually had a previous surgery uh, to, to, to try and fix this, a Caldwell luck incision, um, but it didn't work and now the sinus is filling in with this ground glass material. This can look just like fibrous dysplasia. It can have the same configuration as the surrounding wall. So look for other signs of chronic sinusitis to avoid confusing this with fibrous dysplasia. Hyperostosis also occurs from many different sources, the most common and familiar one being meningioma. This looks just like ground glass from fibrous dysplasia and it maintains the underlying configuration of the bone. Now, this is occurring in a 
classic location for meningioma here in the sphenoid buttress, the way you might tell them apart is that you're seeing this hair on end look of the hyperostosis from meningioma. That's not characteristic of fibrous dysplasia. And if you look carefully, you can see that there's a soft tissue component of the meningioma spreading into all three of the surrounding compartments. Now we're starting to get into the zebras here. Von Buchem's disease is an enostosis that affects a variety of bones, including the jaw and the skull. And you can see it as a thickening with a thickened cortex and thickened trabecular central pattern, very similar to fibrous dysplasia. Uh, this tends to be more diffuse within the skull, however. Another zebra for is, is Engelmann's disease. Uh, maybe more of a pagetoid look to this hyperostotic disease that affects bones, often diffusely, another good distinguishing characteristic from fibrous dysplasia. Here's an example of abnormal bone with an irregular pattern that you might think looks a little like fibrous dysplasia. The key here is that this bone is not expanded, right? It's the same underlying size you'd expect. And once you get to the vertex, now we can see the classic punched out appearance of numerous small multiple myeloma lesions. What differential diagnosis would be complete without a discussion of metastases? I've chosen the MR appearance instead of a CT appearance because I think that's where fibrous dysplasia and metastatic disease could be most easily mistaken. Hopefully when you look at these images, which happen to be lung cancer metastasis, they look a whole lot like that example of fibrous dysplasia MR that I showed earlier in the lecture. Feel free to rewind the lecture and compare those. So there's some examples of fibrous dysplasia and some examples of things that are not fibrous dysplasia that look like fibrous dysplasia. I'm sure that's not a complete list of all the possible mimics of fibrous dysplasia. So if you've got some other ideas on things that look like fibrous dysplasia but aren't, go ahead and leave those examples in the comments.